It's been a real saga with a lot of ups and downs, but Daryl and Jesse are finally on the home stretch with the welded hull grant suspension units. This week, they're going to be fitting the rear idler wheels, and we're getting a special tour of the Grant and Lee tanks from our museum assistant manager, Jason Belgrave. Hi, I'm Kurt from Oz Armour, and welcome to Workshop Wednesday. When we make it around. Last week, we followed Daryl and Jesse removing the old idler wheels and pulling apart the track tensioning system. With everything cleaned up, it's time to put it all back together, starting with the shafts. The middle bolt in this housing is tightened, and this pushes the housing apart so that the shaft can be easily inserted. Once it's fitted, this bolt is wound out and the housing closes. The two bolts either side are then tightened, and this locks everything into place. I won't say what I'm doing. <laughs> or should I? No, don't. <laughs> They cleaned up pretty easy actually. Those two shafts. I think this is a little bit. It's good little Yeah, just, just go back that way, look up that half that. Go that way a bit more. Yep, yep, stop. The idler wheels that came with this vehicle are too badly damaged to use, but we managed to find some that were in near perfect condition. Daz and Jess have cleaned up the bearings and packed them with grease. Now they're good as new and ready to be pressed in. So he hasn't lost it yet. Give him time. Yeah. Give him time. Right no, here, put it straight on there. We've got Biggie bearing, then we've got... Um, Smalls yeah. bearing. This for the, the bigger bearing on the other side, yeah?
Daryl has replaced the grease nipple in both wheels. We will pack as much grease as we can in by hand and then fill it up properly once it's fitted to the tank. There's no easy way of doing this, is there? No. Let, it, let it drop off your hand. You don't want to be here all day. Big cone to the back. Right, yeah. I can put a little bit more in. No, I'll leave it. Well, there's a scrape this stuff off and try and get it to fold in. Yeah, all right. Should be pretty close this one. It's pretty damn good actually. Yep. We'll leave it as it is. We're done hit that edge. I'm going down. Stop there. Thank Yep. We may have pushed too far. Boy. It should be in line with that. What it is is that packer, right, has pushed, oh. must have pushed the other one out. Just feel how far it, yeah, yeah it was in about five mil. So I need to push it out a little bit. Well, we could push those. Oh no, it's, no, it's, it's up against the shoulder. It can't push through. Because they're two different diameters. If we get the two bearings, we can tap them in with the rubber mallet. Now to fit the grease seals. These are the originals off the tank, and luckily they were perfectly preserved and able to be used after a good clean. They would have been very difficult to source otherwise. Gotta push him in now. Smile at. Are we on to the <laughs> like a glove? <laughs> oh, hey, just slipped on. Yeah, give, give us a spin, Dad. Look at that, beautiful. my favourite part, watching it all come together. <laughs> I need to get him around a bit more. Can you keep going? We might have to back it off because it needs to keep going a little bit more. more? 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 You're nearly there. Yep. A uh, little bit more. Tiny little bit more. <laughs> no, that's not. There. Here's the old cotter pin or split pin. I'm not using that. We're going to put a new baby in. New one. New one. Look at that. In like Flynn. That's a good looking cotter pin. That's a good looking cotter pin. Beautiful. Let's get a pair of pliers and fold it over. Sorry, a bit weird. You have a tea cup. Oh, not cup, sorry, me. This thing. Let it dry off a bit. You put it on the wrong way. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. We, we, no, did, did you? No, you do both sides yeah. to get a good seal. Right. So now we'll do this coat this side, and then we'll do the housing on the uh, actual wheel. I love that 
I've ever put that on the thing. Mechanic glitter? Yeah, yeah, glitter for mechanics. This never sees, it just gets everywhere. Oh, yeah. And some guy goes, ah, never sees. Mechanics glitter. <laughs> I don't want to know what Daryl watches in the afternoon. Oh, thanks, <laughs> We won't put the gasket goo on. We'll do that after we've tested the bearing. Yeah, you know, re-tighten it up. What Daryl means is that we're going to need to take this hubcap off after a few laps around the track to tighten up this nut. Once the boys are happy, we'll then apply the last coat of gasket goo and it should be good to go for the next few years. Now we get to do it all over again. Yeah, let's stop! <laughs> Oh, yep. Press it in like that. Hammer. Can you see that stuff? Yeah, no, that's good. My good hand. Your strong hand. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, bye bye. I reckon we might just go to there. Oh, we'll just see how. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. A little bit more. A little bit more. Keep going. Keep going. The bolts are up here, Jess. Have you looking for them? A screen saver. Oh, sorry. Behave, Daryl. Oh, behave. We've had a lot of requests for more information about our grant tank and to see more of the inside of the museum. So here's our museum assistant manager, Jason Belgrave, giving us a bit of a rundown on this iconic early war vehicle. Within the museum, we have a couple of different variants of the M3. So we have the M3 Grant, and over to the right, we have the M3 Lee. So it's not a Lee Grant, it's the change in turrets which makes the, the difference between them. So Australia got uh, about 757 Lees and Grants, about 502 Grants of both petrol and diesel variants, and about 255 Lees in the petrol variant. So this was uh, essentially a medium tank, a stopgap basically, because at that point in time when the Second World War was commencing, they didn't have really the machinery or the tooling to put a fully rotating turret with a bigger gun, that being the 75, uh, on top of the vehicle, so they essentially just had the sponsor gun to start off with. 
The Brits used these uh, in North Africa. The gun was comparable to uh, going up against Panzer threes and fours at fairly uh, good ranges, even though it was only a medium velocity 75. But the only problem was with the design of it, we started off with the Continental R975 radial petrol engine. So this is a massive big aircraft engine, which makes the tank a lot higher because we've got to go from the rear of the vehicle with a drive shaft all the way to the front transmission. So we've got a very high vehicle, uh, which makes it stand out, especially in the desert. The Lee was uh, virtually the first one to come off uh, the design board. So the Americans had the smaller turret, um, as we can see on the Lee. They also had a, an extra cupola on top as well, which was fitted with 30 caliber machine guns. So the British then went, well, hang on, we need a lot of tanks quickly. So they asked the Americans for the, uh, the M3 platform, but they wanted the bigger turret. So on the Lee, we have a seven man crew with the Grant within our bigger turret now, we, have, we go to a six man crew because the radios are now in the turret rather than being inside the hull with its own operator. This is the 75 millimeter. This is the M2 variant. So this is about uh, 32 calibers long where on the Lee over there, we have the M3 variant, which is about 40 calibers long. So we've got the extra length, which also gives us extra muzzle velocity. So the M3 gun gave us an extra 38 meters a second, I think, muzzle velocity out of that. So we've gone from 588 to about 618 in, in the muzzle velocity. And you'll see some of the Lees and Grants that would also have uh, a counterweight on the back, because this is where we start getting into stabilization for the guns, but only in elevation only. Um, stabilization for azimuth didn't come through until Centurion. Um, so you will see some with counterweights on the barrels as well. So this is a Continental R975 uh, radial petrol engine. This could put out anywhere, I think about 340 to 400 horsepower, depending on the, the tune of the, the vehicle itself. With diesels, the Americans did it in both uh, M3 mediums with this and M4 mediums as well. So our M4A2, our Sherman, uh, come with the twin diesels as well. Uh, the M3A5 and the Grants come with the twin diesels. So the Uramba that we've got has got the twin diesels. Um, so this again gives us roughly around about that 400 horsepower. With the Americans, they didn't really use them. They used them as training vehicles. So they didn't actually use diesels in theater, but they gave some to the Soviets as well, which had diesels. But it all comes down to your logistics train as well. You don't want too many fuel sources um, in that one theater. Most allied vehicles had petrol. Um, there was only one German vehicle that, that had diesel, one of their armored cars. So petrol was just that one fuel source that they wanted to use. From one of the Australian generals that said we had, when we got our Lees and Grants come in, that we had defective vehicles because some of the Lees didn't have doors. So they went through a manufacturing process in America where at one point they stopped putting doors in because they thought it might have been a weak point uh, within the side of the vehicle. Um, so we got ones with doors, without doors. We've got the Lee, which has that, the smaller turret. So this is only about 51 millimetres thick all the way around, so about two inches. And if we swing around to the Grant, especially looking at the back now, you can see it's a much larger turret. We've got that bustle at the back where we're putting our uh, number 19 radio. But this now goes to about uh, 75 millimetres thick, so three inches. So it's a lot thicker as well. The, the hulls are almost identical. There's not much difference in the hulls. So this has the um, vertical volute spring suspension. So we've got the springs here. So they're going vertically uh, rather than uh, horizontally, which come in later, especially around the, uh, the M4 um, variants as well. Um, so later variants, we did get, uh, as grants were delivered essentially, we went to the offset guide roller. So we had a slight change in suspension where the guide roller was actually on the back and we had a skate rail along the front as well. So you will see Lees and Grants with M4 Sherman suspension. This is super cramped in here, Jace. How many blokes do they want to fit in here? <laughs> so in this particular event, the Grant, we went down to six people. Um, down so, to six people? Yeah, so the, the Lee had seven because it had the extra radio operator in the hull as well. So the good thing about this is mounting that number 19 uh, radio in the turret is that the commander had direct access to the radio so he could, you know, command the vehicle, command the vehicle and he can listen in rather than having a radio operator, you know, writing him a, a quick message, sending it up um, through that way. Uh, so we've got essentially the driver, the gunner, the loader, 
and then the gunner, the loader, and the commander within the turret. And then when you start adding ammunition, part one CES, yeah, it's just, becomes a very cramped vehicle to operate. It'd be very smelly. Yeah, but you get used to it. <laughs> yeah. After a couple of days, you all smell the same. It, it's fine. It would uh, be. Anyone, anyone new coming in the vehicle? You know, you'll come in, you'll see salamis hanging up inside the vehicles. You know, they've got their boiling vessel. So as long as they've got a hot brew and, you know, they can have a uh, salami and cheese sandwich, it's all good. <laughs> There's no doors on this at all. How do they get in the tank? So on the back behind the gun, you had the loader's hatch. So they could get out through there. And obviously the commander had his hatch to get out as well. So even though having a door can affect your structural integrity when, if you're getting shot at, I'd rather have that door to be able to try and get out because again, the driver is the last one out and if he can fit through that front hatch, I'm sure he's going through it. So as opposed to our other Lee and Grant that we had in the museum, which were riveted, this is our welded Grant. So obviously the difference you can see is we have a lot of welding instead of having rivets on, on the majority of this vehicle. Um, so with this particular vehicle, this was the uh, 455th Baldwin tank to come off the production line. So this was June 1942. Uh, the guys at the uh, Surviving Panzers website, Jean Perrier, provided us with a lot of information on this vehicle. Uh, so we know when it was built, who built it, uh, the serial numbers that was attached to it. Uh, it was in the 2,835, something along the lines of there. So we have the serial number, which is uh, generally stamped on the front but what we find is you always go off the serial number off the back because we know that the front transmission can be changed so the serial number on the back is t455 there's only 83 of the m3 a3 grants built um, so out of the 83 australia said they have 15 to 20 percent so probably looking around sort of that 16 welded grants within Australia. There's only three left in Australia at various stages of disrepair. So this had the twin GMs, um, so in the 6046 configuration. So this still gives us around about that close to 400 horsepower um, propulsion in this one as well. So with this one in particular, we're starting to see probably some after war mods. And the best one that we have on the front is these mounting points that we have one, two and three. Uh, these mounting points are also on our Uramba. So now we have a two inch extra thick casted plate, which uh, covers the whole front uh, transmission area. Um, so we have photos of these appearing on Australian grants pretty much after World War II as well. So we've got an extra, say two inches of extra protection on the front. So the machine gun ports were welded with most Lees and grants anyway. This was essentially supposed to be operated uh, by the, the driver, um, but trying to drive and operate twin machine guns at the same time, you've got to orientate your vehicle towards the enemy. Bad idea, I think, in principle, so most of them are all welded up. Some of the grants that we did get into Australia we had the upgraded Sherman bogies. So we've got the, uh, the offset guide roll that sits on here, and you can see that the skate rail as well, uh, that uh, allows the track to uh, slide a lot easier. Um, and obviously we've got our side doors, as opposed to some of the leads which which don't have them. Like we saw in our other Grant uh, with the Continental R975, this one had the twin diesels, so the back end of the vehicle is different. So instead of having the doors here, we've got the, uh, the extra plate that sort of comes out. The exhaust is also under here as well, but to access the engines themselves is actually done through the top of the engine deck with the doors that open up. This is, looks like a pile of rusty rubbish but <laughs> definitely not rubbish this stuff this is gold this is grenade mesh uh, that was made for the grants got to make a, a kit for their mounting points etc for it but uh, to have this on the vehicle is going to be really rare and special this particular vehicle we found out uh, through uh, the archives that it um, got taken out of service in april of 1956 it went through the disposals program so I've actually got this serial number listed along with all the others with an exact disposal date as well. Um, so then they went for auction. A lot of the farmers bought them. Um, and within the museum, we have a M3 grant that has been cut down by a meter. So in the centre, they've cut a meter out. They've taken one set of bogies out. They've shortened it. Um, and they've made a blade and a tree pusher on it as well. So good use of vehicles that were available after the war. A lot of the bulldozers during World War II were obviously utilised for other things. So for farmers, having an armoured vehicle 
straight after the war, like Matildas took the turrets off them. There is a video in the National Archives where you can see two Matildas with a big chain in between and just driving along, stripping the ground. And now that we're going through this restoration with uh, Jess and Daz, so hopefully they'll finish it off next week and uh, it'll be up and running for Oz Armour Fest. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. No worries. We were pretty confident that the restoration of the suspension units was nearly complete. How wrong we were. The arms and shafts were incredibly difficult to disassemble, being seized solid with rust and red earth. But with a big effort, the lads got them all apart. That's all we have time for today. I know there hasn't been a Stug 3 update from Bo for a while, he's been caught up with other projects lately, but rest assured we'll have a fantastic Stug episode up in the next few weeks, but in the meantime don't forget to join us next Wednesday for your weekly tank restoration fix. Until then, I'm Kurt from Oz Armour and I'll see you on the next one.